Well, good evening and thanks for coming out tonight as we finish off or we'll guess wrap up our three-part series. So the first week we had a look at God's promise to reverse the curse of mortality. Um, last week we had a look at God's promise to all people. And this week Brad's going to be having a look at God's promise that you can live forever in a perfect world. And so we, we look forward to finding out that promise. It sounds pretty amazing to me um, and I'm sure it's, it's somewhere we, we all want to be. So before we um, get into it, we're just going to open up um, and say a prayer to our, our Father. An amazing God, we, we come to thank you for your word that we have in front of us in this book, the Bible. And Father, as we've opened it up and considered two of your many promises in the last couple of weeks, we've been amazed by by what you have offered us and, and have for us on the table, that, that we can be a part of that amazing hope where death is no more, that we can be a part of, of your family and of, of the inheritance that you promised to Abraham to be able to live in this world forever. And Father, we look forward to finding out tonight about this perfect world, which again contains the phrase forever. And we pray that as we open up and, and read from your word that that we might be able to understand what you've read, written out for us and that it may help us on our, our journey to become more like you. And so we pray that you'll be with everything we do tonight and it's through your son's name we pray. Jesus, our saviour. Amen. So this final promise is, is based in 2 Samuel 7, and we're going to be having a look at verse 1 to 17 of 2 Samuel 7. Um, and James is going to come and, and read that for us. But um, before he does, as we've seen in the first two nights, um, the, the first two promises um, really revolved and were fulfilled by this male descendant, um, this future descendant that's coming. So as James is reading 2 Samuel 7, um, definitely something to listen out for, because it's going to link right into what Brad's going to be talking about tonight. So have a, have a listen out for that seed or descendant. Reading together 2 Samuel 7, verse 1 to 17. Now when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies... The king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, I did speak a word with any, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from your, all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled, and you lie down with your fathers, 
I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the son of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and in accordance with all the vision, Nathan spoke to David. Thanks, James. Well, we look forward to Brad, um, Brad's words tonight as he looks at living forever in a perfect world. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I've hope, I hope you've all had a wonderful day so far, and welcome to our Sunday night lecture tonight. <clears throat> as Michael has said, tonight's talk will be to the theme God's promise, you can live forever in a perfect world. And we will specifically focus on the promise to David as the third of, th of three of the great promises given in the Old Testament. And we know these promises are all given to us as well, and we can be a part of them, as we read in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, which we've put up um, every week just to remind us to make these promises personal to us says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So all three of these promises are given to us that we might escape sin and death and have a nature and character like God, so we can give glory to him. To begin tonight, I thought we would briefly recap what we've discussed during the last two weeks, which was the promise given in the Garden of Eden, which we covered in the first week, and the promises given to Abraham, which we covered last week. So the promise given in Eden. This promise was given after Adam and Eve had sinned. The sentence for this sin was death as it says in Genesis 2, verses 16 to 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And Adam and Eve, through temptation and deception, did take of the fruit, and so they were sentenced to death. And we know that this mortality has passed on to all people, as it says in Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, as by one man, that is, by Adam, sin has entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So we all have this sin-prone nature. We all have this leaning towards sin, and so we all die. But in Genesis 3, a promise was made that one day this mortality would be reversed. In Genesis 3, verse 15, and I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, that is, between sin and those who follow God, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So there was a promise that a seed would come, and although his heel would be bruised, just a temporary injury, his blow to the serpent, which represents sin, would kill it forever. That the seed is Jesus Christ, who died, but through his sacrifice, he conquered death and gave us all a chance to live through him. So that was the first week. And in the second week, we talked about the promises to Abraham. And Abraham was given several promises through Genesis chapters 12 to 22. He was promised 
that he would be a great nation, that he would be blessed by God, that in him all families of the earth will be blessed. He was promised to be given the land of Israel and he was promised that his seed, so his descendants, would be as the stars in heaven and as the sand upon the seashore. And we can see that these promises were fulfilled in part by the Jews, who are his descendants. However, we know that the promise is still to come, and Abraham never fully received his promises while he was alive. And we're told this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, the chapter on all the faithful men and women of old, where it says, these all, that is, including Abraham, so Abraham died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So Abraham saw these promises being fulfilled one day, but he was going to die. So this shows the, the wonderful faith that he had. He knew God would be true to his word and that God would give him all that he promised him, even if the time had not yet come. We also discussed last week how we can be a part of Abraham's seed, the innumerable seed as the stars of heaven through Jesus Christ. And we looked at Galatians chapter 3, where it talks about this topic, and verse 29, where it says, If ye be Christ, be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We also talked about the importance of faith in God and how great of an example Abraham is about this. So I hope that's helped everyone to, to be able to remember a bit about the last two nights, about the promise to reverse the curse of mortality and the promise that has been made to all people. But tonight, we will be concluding this three-part series by discussing the promise God made to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, which James read for us tonight. And that is the promise that we can live, together, live forever in a perfect world. So I've taken out the verses that really contain the bulk of the promise that we want to look at tonight which are verses 10 to 16 in 2 Samuel chapter 7, um, and made the more specific phrases um, and promises uh, bold to help them really stand out. Um, but just to make it easier, um, I've also made a list of these main points just to clear up the screen a little bit to make it a bit easier to follow as we go through them. So the first point that was of the promise that was given to David was that Israel would have a place that would be peaceful. So we know from Abraham's promise that, that the land of Canaan, what is now the nation of Israel, would be the land for his descendants, that is, for the Jews. Now, the Jewish possession of that land lasted from when a man called Joshua, who led the Hebrews after Moses died, conquered the land of Canaan. And the possession lasted until the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70, and the Jews were then dispersed around the world. But throughout that whole time that they lived in the land, they, they were taken into captivity, they had people threaten them, and they were puppet states for other empires, besides also fighting many, many wars. So Israel's history has not been peaceful at all. Even just a couple of weeks ago, Israel and Hamas were firing rockets at each other. So this part of the promise has not yet been fulfilled. It is, therefore, something that will happen in the future. So the next point uh, from the promise is that God will make a house of David. So as with Abraham, God promised that he will make David into a great house and as David is a direct descendant of Abraham, this is like an extension onto the promise to Abraham. As king, David's house would be the royal house of Israel. His descendants ruled Israel, and later the kingdom of Judah, after the kingdom split. They ruled those kingdoms for centuries 
before being taken into captivity in Babylon. And we'll see as we go on tonight that another very significant king would come, would come after and he would also be descended from David, from the royal line. The third point from the promise is that David's seed will come after his death. So continuing on in the promise, we see that David was promised a seed that would come after him. Now, we know David had children when he was alive and that Solomon, one of his sons, became king after David. But he could not be the promised seed because the promise said that the seed would come after David's death and Solomon was anointed and became king when David was still alive. So this promised descendant would have to be someone else. The next point is that God would establish David's seed's kingdom and that that kingdom would last forever. So one day, God will establish a kingdom centred in Israel and that kingdom will have no end. It is especially important to note here that the kingdom is to be David's seed's kingdom forever. And if that seed is to rule the kingdom forever, that must mean that the seed is immortal. Another detail about David's special descendant is the next point, that he will also be God's son as well as David's son. And the last point I've got up there is that God will establish David's house and throne forever before him. Now, the most important thing about this part of the promise is that it must imply that David will be resurrected from the dead. Because when it says before him, it literally means in front of him, which means he must be alive. But we've already said that the seed will come after David's death. So for David to see his descendants' kingdom being established, he must be raised from the dead. And we are told of this in the prophecy of Jeremiah in chapter 30 and verse 9, where it says, But they, Israel, shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. So the promise to David is so exciting and full of rich, amazing promises of an everlasting, peaceful kingdom that will be established in the earth and centred especially around Israel. So the next thing we want to look at is who is the seed. As Michael pointed out, this is quite an important part of this promise. So let's just remind ourselves of the requirement of this seed so we can figure out who it is. The first thing is that he has to be born after David's death. He must also be David's son, so he has to be descended from David of the royal line of Israel. He must also be God's son, and he must live forever. So he must be immortal. So as we've discussed in previous sessions, the seed is, of course, Jesus Christ. He is the one who crushed the power of sin by his death. And he is also the one through whom we can be a part of Abraham's family and heirs of the promises to Abraham. So just to make sure that the seed is Jesus Christ, we'll now just go through each of the characteristics that I put up in the previous slide to, to really prove from the Bible that he is that promised seed. So the first point was that he must be born after David's death. In Matthew 2 and verse 1, it says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. So Herod was the king in Israel when Israel was under the control of the Roman Empire. And he, it was roughly a thousand years after David's death. So quite clearly, this part of, of, the, promise, of the seed is true with Christ. The next point is that he must be the son of David. 
And we see in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1 an introduction into the genealogy of Christ. For it says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And Jesus is called the son of David at least 16 times in the New Testament. And for further proof, in Matthew and also in Luke, there are genealogies of Jesus, which show that he is the literal descendant of both Abraham and David. The third point about the seed is that he also has to be the son of God. And in the introduction to another part of the gospel, in Mark chapter 1 and verse 1, it is introduced as the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. For further proof, we also read in Luke chapter 1 and verse 35 that the Holy Spirit, which is God's power, would come upon Mary, Jesus' mother, and that by God's power she would conceive and that child would be called the Son of God. And the final point about the seed is that he must be immortal. And we read about that in Romans 6 verse 9, where it says, Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. There are many other passages that refer to Christ being raised to immortality, but this verse, I think, just puts it very simply and clearly. So we can see how Jesus Christ fulfills all the requirements set out in the promise to David. He is clearly the promised seed that will inherit David's throne forever. And David himself will see him sitting on his throne in his kingdom in Israel. So just to finish up this section on the promise to David, I'll just put Luke chapter 1 verses 31 to 33 on the screen because these verses really show the promise to David being fulfilled in Jesus Christ and uses quite a bit of the language that we have been using so far tonight. These words were spoken to Mary, the mother of Jesus, by the angel Gabriel, who gave the message to Mary on behalf of God. And it says, And, behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. So this sounds like a really amazing promise, doesn't it? A promise that Jesus Christ will live forever in his kingdom, free from death, and that Israel, or the Jews, which we know includes us from Galatians chapter 3, which we looked at last week, that all of us will have a place and that there will be peace. We have discussed in previous weeks about how we can be a part of these promises. And I would like to go through a few of the main points as well. Now, this is by no means a comprehensive full list, but just a few of the main things that we can, be, that we can do to make sure we are a part of that amazing kingdom. So the first point um, comes up in Habakkuk 2 verse 4 and is also quoted in Romans 1 verse 7. And that is that the just shall live by faith. So last week, when Michael talked about the promises to Abraham, he talked for a bit about faith and the importance of that faith. Here in this verse, we can see that God is teaching us through the prophet, through the prophet sorry, Habakkuk and through Paul that having faith leads to life. The just shall live by faith. Now, faith is defined in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, where it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, 
the evidence of things not seen. So faith is essentially being able to believe in something that you hope for, knowing that it will come. So we we must have the faith that God will give us his promises, that God will bring his kingdom to earth, and that we will be a part of it. Now, we haven't seen the kingdom because it's not here yet, but we must trust in God. We must have faith that it will come. The next verse I want to point out is Romans 10, verse 9, where it says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The next thing we are told um, that we need to do is to confess our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and believe that God raised him from the dead. See, this is so essential for us because we must be able to show our beliefs to those around us. And further, we must have faith that Jesus was raised. We must believe it because if he wasn't raised, then that's a death sentence for us. We read about this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 16 to 17. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, yea, yet in your sins. The reason that this is so important is that if Christ is not raised, then what's the point? There would be nothing to hope for because the resurrection of the dead would not happen. So having the faith and knowing that Christ is raised and that he is alive is so important for us to believe. The next point I want to look at is Mark 16, verse 16. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved. So this point is one of the most crucial points. The idea of belief is brought up again here as well. And, and this shows us that this is clearly a very important idea. But as well as believing, we must also act on our belief. We must also be baptised. Now, baptism is a small, simple act, but it has so much significance. Because when we are baptised, we're saying that we are sinful. We acknowledge that by ourselves, we can do nothing to save ourselves from death. Being baptised is a symbol that we are putting our old, sinful way of life to death because we're buried by the water and that we will now try and live our lives like Christ. The last point I want to bring up is Matthew 7 verse 21 where it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So this final point that I wanted to bring up is that of doing God's will. Because it is possible for us to be baptised and to seem like we're being faithful, a faithful, good person, when when deep down we're not following God's will. We may be doing things for the wrong reason, for example. And we could be doing good things just to be seen by others. These are the sort of ideas that Jesus condemned the Pharisees about, a group of uh, very conservative Jewish believers who believed that just by their acts that they would be saved, so they would make sure that they are seen to be doing them. But but Jesus says here that you can say to him, Lord, Lord, and appear to be a faithful servant, but the only way to enter the kingdom is by actually doing God's will and living with a character like Jesus Christ. So now that we have gone through the promise to David and how we can be a part of that promise, I thought it would be a good way 
um, like to, uh, sorry, it would be a good way to finish off this series by talking for a bit about that perfect world, which is part of the title for tonight. And have a look at some parts of the Bible that talk about the coming kingdom so we can really build a picture of the world that God is building, a perfect world, and one that we can be in if we choose. So the first verse I want to look at is Proverbs 29, verse 18, which really explains why we might want to do this. It says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. So the second part of that verse really covers, again, the idea of following God and keeping his commands. But the first part of the verse is where I really want to focus just for now. Just to highlight the importance of having a vision of the coming kingdom. Because if we don't have a picture, it's hard to really have something to walk towards. Without a picture, we won't have a destination in sight. So we could get lost on the way. This is why it's so important to have a vision of the coming kingdom so we can always look forward, no matter how hard life gets, to that kingdom to come and have a great hope. So we're going to have a look at a few quotes now. Some are a bit long, but I think they paint a really amazing picture. Uh, again, this is not a complete list. There are so many parts of the Bible that talk about how amazing the kingdom is. But for the time being, I've just selected four that, um, that really paint a powerful picture. So the first one I want to look at is Isaiah chapter 2 and verses 3 and 4. where it says, And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. This first quote really focuses in on the importance of Israel. As we have seen in the promise to David tonight, Israel plays a really crucial, important role in God's eyes. And here we can see that in the future, God will have, will have Israel, especially Jerusalem, Mount Zion, as the centre of his worship and as the centre of learning about God. And the next verse, verse 4, is a very famous verse that speaks about peace on earth and the end of war being fought on earth. In fact, it's written in a park in New York across from the UN building. And an interesting thing to note about this, note, about this verse and the third quote I'm going to mention a bit later is that these sort of things, as evidenced by the fact that it's right next to the UN building, these are the sorts of goals set up by many big organisations and institutions in the world today. It's something that the world seeks after. World peace. It's a, it's a big goal for so many in the world, but it's a goal that will never be achieved just by man. Putting an end to violence is something which many people want, but the world will never get it because the world will always have a reason to fight. But this verse shows that world peace is something God wants too. But the difference is that when the kingdom of God comes to earth, it will happen 
World peace will be achieved. And God has said that it will. We must have faith that it will happen. The next verse I want to look at is Habakkuk 2, verse 14, where it says, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So I brought up this verse because it really shows the purpose God has for the earth, to fill it with his glory and the knowledge of that glory. When the kingdom comes, the world will be filled with people who have done the things that we've spoken about before. They've all chosen to follow God, to believe, to be baptised and to do God's will. So we can know that when all those who have chosen God are brought into his kingdom, everyone that is in the kingdom will be followers of God and this will give glory to him and will bring about his purpose with the earth. The next quote I want to look at is Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4. And this is John writing, one of the disciples of Christ. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. How amazing does that sound? God has such a wonderful plan for this world. And over the past few nights, we've seen that we can be a part of all of these promises. And that God has made it possible for us through his son Jesus Christ to be a part of this amazing kingdom and this kingdom will be perfect and the world will be perfect just how God wants it and not only that we will be free from sin and death completely immortal beings and God will dwell with us in this perfect kingdom I just want to finish tonight with one of my favourite verses, one that really captures just how truly awesome God's kingdom will be. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared, for them that love him. All that we have spoken about tonight has been so wonderful. The pictures of peace, the picture of God's glory filling the earth. No more sin, no more death, no more pain or sorrow. God dwelling with us. It is such a positive, amazing picture. But these things are things we can imagine. It may be difficult, but they're things we can understand. But this verse shows that shows that the true awesomeness of what God has prepared, that we just cannot understand it. We cannot even imagine in our wildest dreams what God will do for those who love him. It will be so great. And what we really hope we've been able to, to get across to you all in the, in the last few, few nights is that we are all impi- invited to be a part of it. The offer has been given to us. We just need to take it. So I hope you've all enjoyed our lecture tonight and thank you for coming out to listen. I hope you've been able to see 
over the past three weeks just how great these precious promises are that God has given to every one of us. So thanks for listening and God be with you all. Thanks very much, Brad. So we've seen three of the promises that that God's made to us, haven't we? The first night we saw the promise to reverse mortality and in in a very similar way to to how it all started and how we became subject to death um, with someone choosing not to listen to God, we saw that it's going to be solved in the same way by by someone choosing to listen to God and, and by other people choosing to follow that example. And we saw the second promise, that that we can be a part of God's family and that he's going to turn us from our sins. Um, We can have them forgiven. And that's an amazing promise for each of us um, to have, that we can have our sins forgiven. And then tonight, Brad has shown us that that God has an amazing plan with the earth and and how it's going to be ruled. Um, And and as Brad said, it it is an awesome, awesome promise that God has made to us, a perfect world that we can live forever in. And so we're seeing that, that these three th- promises, when you put them together, it's, it's pretty amazing what God has, has promised to each of us. Um, and it's really up to us to choose whether we want to be a part of them. He's given us the promises for us and, and shown us how we can be a part if we choose to follow him and listen to what he says in his Bible. And so we hope um, you've been able to, to follow the, the last three nights and, and, and be able to take something away from it. And if you have any questions... Um, please come up and have a chat to me or Brad after we finish and we'll be more than happy to to chat them through with you. So we will wrap up tonight. Um, I guess um, next week we've got another another Bible topic that we're going to be having a look at and it's going to be on the devil and the fact that he's closer than you may think. Um, So if you can join us next week at 6 o'clock, we'll be having a look at that. This Tuesday um, we also have some seminars here at the Hall Um, and they start at 7.30, and if you want some more information, come and see me, and I can run you through that. Um, But that's this Tuesday at 7.30. So if if you want to stand with me, um, there'll be supper after, um, so some drinks and food going around, but we'll just close tonight in prayer. Our Father... You are the the God of all the earth and you've created everything that we see around us. And Father, we are pretty overwhelmed as we've considered the last three nights and what you've promised to us. You live far above the heavens and yet you've made promises to, to us on earth that we can be a part of your family, that we can have the effects of death removed from us and that we can live forever with you here on this earth in a perfect world where there's no no more pain or sorrow, where there's no crying, when the world will be filled with with peace and people that want to be like you and to share your characteristics of love, of mercy, of forgiveness and of kindness and compassion. And Father, where We do want to be a part of these promises and we pray that you would continue to work with each of us, continue to help us to understand what's at stake if we choose not to listen to you and that you'd continue to show us your amazing plan and purpose so that we can begin to comprehend what you've got in store for this earth. Father, we we can't wait for this earth to be reversed and, and to see it restored, to see everybody on the planet getting along with each other and there to be no more war, to be no more fighting, but people will get on and be able to help each other and, and create this amazing world. And Father, we, we can't wait to be there and we, we've seen that all of these promises are, are as a, pretty much as a result of one man choosing to live like you have asked. And we thank you for your son, Jesus, and we pray that we may continue to learn more about him and, and the way that he's shown for us to follow. And so it's through his name that we now pray. Jesus, our Saviour and our King. Amen.